Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And this week, I'm going to be talking with Zach Thompson and Lonnie Nadler, and I will be uh, Lonnie Nadler. <laughs> Nadler, <laughs> I've already got it wrong. <laughs> Lonnie Nadler. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so anyway, I'll be. I'll introduce those two charming gentlemen in a couple of moments. Before I do that. Um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out again to the Book of Monsters. If you've been following my Facebook page, you'll see me posting, posting, posting. Basically, Book of Monsters. Uh, we had Paul and Stuart on a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about their campaign, which is to raise £45,000. They've got just over £35,000. They've got three days to make the last £10,000. Um, so they are, and obviously, it's an all out nothing campaign because it's on kickstarter and this is the movie where you as a backer get to choose the key plot points in the movie like choosing monsters choosing weapons choosing deaths and depending on the winning votes then the whole story changes so the whole thing so it's really i've never seen it done quite like this before it really is make your own movie um so uh check out Book of Monsters on Kickstarter because uh, they're so close, but they need to get all £45,000 or they don't get anything and they don't make a movie. So, we, and as a, one of the stars of it, I'd really like to do this. Um, so the other thing I want to do is to give a shout out to Kate Shenton's uh, film Egomaniac, which is screening tomorrow night at the Prince Charles Theatre, Leicester Square, London at 6.15 and Paddy Murphy is going to be there to demonstrate the egomaniac game. Um, I've, I've no idea what it looks like, but uh, Kate Shenton apparently played it today. Looks what she's really pleased with it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. So if you're in London and uh, it's really cheap, I mean, it's only like eight quid a ticket or something like that, uh, come along and join us tomorrow evening. And the last thing is at the end of the show, I'm going to be talking about next week's show, which is the tribute to George Romero and going over the thing about the survey uh, that you may need to complete if you want to contribute to the tribute. Uh, and the other thing is is just a quick heads up and reminder Nova Nights I'm going to be at Nova Nights on the 16th of August where I'm going to be interviewed I'm going to be screening The Night Whispered and introducing the film Hellbent which is the first gay slasher movie um, which is great fun um, so anyway that yeah so that's all that now Lonnie Zach would you like to introduce yourselves sure <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is Lonnie Nadler. I'm a writer based in Vancouver, Canada. I uh, came from Ottawa and from Montreal, and uh, I guess we're known for anything. It's, uh, we both write for Vice, and we have a comic book uh, that just finished called The Dregs from Black Mass Studio. So most of that is the same for me. My name is Zach Thompson. I'm a writer based in Vancouver. <laughs> Um, we're known for writing the dregs and working at Vice. I also have a novel coming out in October um, that was the winner of the 2016 Crypt TV Horror Fiction Contest, and that's a weird book about sexually transmitted guns. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a real weird career trajectory. <laughs> I want to read a book about sexually tr transmitted guns. That sounds <laughs> really cool. And who's who's that published by, Zach? Uh, it's published by Crypt TV and Inkshares. Inkshares is like a crowdfunded uh, book publisher based in San Francisco. Right. Yes. Yes. And I've heard of Inkshares before. And that comes out on October thirty first. And it's called Weaponized. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll keep it. And if you send me some links and so on, I'll add that to this show, oh, uh, nice. so that people can know about that. As and so, how to purchase the dregs, which we're going to be talking about today. So, what's the best way for people to get hold of the dregs? So, if you read comics digitally, uh, the best way to find the dregs is on Comicsology. Um, you can also find it on Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk. Um, they'll have all the single issues digitally available, and they will also have the trade, which is coming out on August the 9th. Um, if you wait until August the 9th, the trade should be available in any local comic book store. Um, you probably want to call ahead because we've been having issues with selling out of the dregs often. So. It's oh, wow. Uh, so this is the trade paperback we're talking about here when you say the trade. Yeah, yeah okay. so anywhere, if you're in Canada, the US, or anywhere in the UK, you should be able to order it through any comic book store. 
Wow, that's brilliant. That excellent. Okay, cool. I shall definitely keep an eye out for it. Um, okay, so let's wind back. So that's how you can get hold of the dregs. I'm fortunate enough to have been in a situation, as I said to you guys, I absolutely adore this comic. Um, Lonnie had actually sent me a copy of the first issue. Um, this is back in February. Does that sound right? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around there. Yeah, somewhere around there. And it, I was like, oh, wow, this is just brilliant. Okay, so and one of the things that I think that did... Uh, oh, actually, before we get too much into this, can you just tell me what... You said you both contribute to Vice. What is Vice? Vice is a, a journalism outlet slash TV network slash uh, online media. Uh, they're, they're quite big, and they, they're sort of like uh, the punk rock news coverage and political commentary social justice issues and then sex drugs and rock and roll so we cover it all. <laughs> that sounds cool and that's on so that's is that vice.com or yeah there's vice.com um, vice.ca vice.ca and then they have facebook pages and uh vice land is their tv network and yeah they're, they're all over oh okay Cool, cool. All right. So we'll, um, yeah, something else for me to check out. Okay. So, um, right, let's re return to the dregs. So how did the, well, actually, let's go back further than the dregs. How did you guys meet up to begin with? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, we met on a bus coming back from Emerald City Comic Con in <laughs> 2000. <laughs> 2013, yeah. Yeah, I was ranting about comics to a friend of mine on the bus, and I'm a loud talker. And uh, uh, Lonnie came up to me uh, in, like at immigration, I think, like at the border. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and so we just got chatting, and then we both just, like, I don't know. Then we started talking about Argento movies, and then it was just like, yeah. hey, we were off from there. Like, best friend from the start. <laughs> yeah, I think the first time we hung out, we went to see Goblin. Yeah, together. let's see Goblin, who does all the scores for Dario Argento's movies yeah. at a real weird theater <laughs> yeah. on the downtown east side, which is like the Skid Row of Vancouver. Yeah, we basically went to see Goblin in the dregs. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty awesome. And we, uh, Yeah, I don't know, from there, uh, we just started, we've both been in film school, and we talked about working on some stuff together. We developed a concept that uh, is actually our next book, but then uh, Zach had written a screenplay yeah, the, the Dregs was originally a screenplay that I wrote at film school um, that was basically, uh, they told me it was <laughs> a really stupid idea and that I shouldn't make it, and that I was writing uh, a theme first. And I was like, isn't that how you're supposed to write <laughs> screenplays? <laughs> and so uh, it, it, a lot of the core elements were not there in the, in the original screenplay. It was still a homeless detective story, but the cannibalism wasn't there, and a lot of the... Uh, we basically took the core idea of that screenplay and stripped it down to its bare bones and rebuilt it from the ground up. I, I, I have to say, the reading it, I just thought, oh, God, I do hope this gets made into a movie, because... We do, it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you rewritten it as a screenplay, but now based on the comics, or...? No, not it's, until someone pays us to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's it's obviously like something that we'd really like to do because we both love film and we would both love to. If this got adapted into film, like the ideal way to do it would be letting us do it. <laughs> but yeah. they don't trust it's young tough, guys so. like us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I assume, I mean, it's not going to be a big Hollywood movie, and you probably don't want it to be a big Hollywood movie, I, I, you know. But I, I, I think when I, when I, I read your comic yesterday after I finished reading the book, it's that basically it reminds me of Memento, in that you have an unreliable narrator, um, or a, 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 a narrator who's uh, dealing with possibly mental health issues um and that's one of the joys of the book as well but okay so you met on the bus you you, you became far, first uh fast friends is this the first project you've collaborated on so we did we pitched we created a pitch for something else together and yeah. that's sort of a homage to david cronenberg and clive barker it's a weird body horror with some science fiction elements uh that's actually going to be our next book 
through the same publisher, which we're um, deathly afraid to release because we're just groping in the dark and we're like, yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> but we felt that way about the drags and it worked out okay. So we'll and <laughs> otherwise, Zach and I had worked on some film, some smaller film projects together. Um, stuff, just stuff we'd shot for either friends or our own <laughs> scripts or whatever. Um, so we've been collaborating on and off, and we've written some articles together as well. So yeah, yeah, and I mean, we we have a we work at the same day job too. So I mean, we're yeah, yeah. we're writing together like all day every day. <laughs> right. Okay. So what day job do you do? Uh, we work for a digital media company called BBTV, and we work for the part of that company that is a partnership with uh, HuffPost. And we basically produced uh, videos related to social issues or news or spotlighting celebrities doing interesting things. And then we do, uh, sometimes we do like mini documentaries for them as well. Right, 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 right. Uh, okay, so, and then, so what was the inspiration? So you've got the screenplay of The Dregs. Yeah, why did, what, what was the inspiration for actually changing it into a comic? Um, I think it was the idea that a lot of what was in the screenplay were, was it was a good idea in theory, but there's a lot of it that needed to be reworked in terms of theme and everything like that. And for something like the dregs, there's a lot of tone that needs to be communicated, and there's a lot of uh, homage and everything like that. And so by, by taking it and putting it into comics, we were able to meticulously control every page, and we were able to create a really... Um, like robust representation of all the influences that went into generating the idea. And I think also like we both love comic books and it was this idea that like when you're a writer, you're, you're writing screenplays and stuff like that. And it's not necessarily uh, super uplifting because it's like no one's reading them. And we had connections in the comic book industry that uh, we, we thought, why not? Why not try this out? Why not do something where we can be in control and we can kind of direct the story the way that we want? And luckily, we had a connection at Black Mass that really helped us out with that. Yeah, I think part of it was just accepting that this was a comic book as well, as, as opposed to a film first, and then writing it specifically for that medium without it serving as just a pitch for something else or hoping that it would get adapted. We wanted to stand on its own as a comic book above all else. Uh, because a lot of people write comic books hoping that they'll be turned into movies. And while that would be nice, we wanted to use the medium of comics in a way that you can't do with film. Yeah, I, I mean, we purposely went out of our way multiple times to put stuff in the book that would would just make people scratch their heads if they tried to make a movie out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting, as I say, because every time I, as I was reading it, it, it feels like a film. You know, it's it, it, it. You know, a lot of the, and again, we should mention, and, and now we should mention Eric uh, Zavadsky, uh, who did the pencils, inks, and lettering of of the comic. Because um, you, I mean, the the first page of the comic, uh, for those of you who are going to pick it up, basically it starts with three wide screen shots of the skyline of Vancouver one above each other and it's like yeah this just feels like a movie um, because we've got these little, almost like a storyboard and then you turn the page and then suddenly the panels are slightly different but you still get the idea you know that this is it feels like a movie um now so perhaps that is un unintentional what how did you get together with Eric because his artwork is just superb yeah, I mean, I think we wanted to still feel cinematic. A lot of our influence was uh, like Paul Thomas Anderson and Roman Polanski and stuff like that, just in terms of like how the non-existent camera would mm. in throughout the book. Um, but then, you know, knowing when to subvert that and, and just take advantage of the comic book medium uh, in addition to our cinematic influences. Uh, and then with Eric, uh, Eric was a local Vancouver artist. Um, Zach had reviewed some of his comics. And yeah, I had also. We both used to work for BloodyDisgusting.com. Right. We were editors there. Uh, and so we, yeah, we got to know Eric through that and then moved to Vancouver and we hung out with him a couple of times through some mutual friends. And we, yeah, we were looking to do some comics and we met up with him and he was open to doing something with us and we sent him the dregs on a whim and thankfully he, he was, was into it yeah. yeah and the and the neat thing about eric was that 
we had talked to a lot of artists about what we wanted to do and, and the stories that we wanted to create. And right from the get-go, I can remember the first time we sat down with Eric, he was very concerned about storytelling. He was very concerned about the characters, what their motivations were, what their relationships were. And frankly, like the first stuff that we sent him, it wasn't all there. And he was the guy who pushed us to do better and, and to make sure that that storytelling was always like on point. Like he, he deserves as much credit as anyone for this book because he really pushed us to find the narrative. Yeah, it was a lot of pushing, sort of a mutual thing, because then when we got onto scripting, we write really long, dense scripts yeah. compared to a lot of comic book writers, uh, which is no slight against them. It's just, you know, the method that we choose to mm. employ. So we were constantly giving Eric these, like, crazy... It'd be like 50 ideas. pages. Yeah. Like a 50-page script for a 22-page comic. <laughs> uh, that is a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, giving these crazy ideas, and, and he was able to not only execute them, but often challenge himself to make the pages uh, more elaborate or to make the form match the narrative. And yeah, he was just, uh, it was just a collaboration across the board. And a lot of our really terrible sketches of some of the more experimental <laughs> pages, like we would draw them out by pen and like scan them in into the script, and it's just like. I, every time we send him a script, we're like, he's going to hate us. He's just going to hate what he's seen here. <laughs> I was interested, because we talk, as I say, it's cinematic, but I think I, think I counted tw uh, 13, 14 panels on some of the pages. You know, really tiny. And the, the, what I found most amazing is the fact that he actually managed to fit the words in. You were saying earlier on, uh, bef before we came on air, that he, because he does everything himself, he does his layout. What can you tell me? So you're sending him huge, great, thick documents, it sounds like, in terms of a script. And I presume when you say they're densely written, this is the description of each panel that you're giving him? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, we, we tried, so like, we prefaced every script with the idea that like, this is our best representation of how we think this scene should play out. However, you're the storyteller. So when you get to the page, if you can think of a better way to do it, by all means, like, you know, work, flex your muscles and show us how it's done. And so, like, some of those 14 panel pages, maybe were seven or eight when we sent them to him. And he was like, no, 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 I'm going to go hard on this. I'm going to really pull things out. And, like, there's pages that he added. Yeah, and we, like, we love high panel page counts, but we, you know, we know it's a pain in the ass for artists. So we try not to go too hard on it. Uh, I think the most we'd ever asked was like 10, but then sometimes Eric would take like a nine panel grid that we'd asked for and turn it into like a 12 panel grid. And we'd be like, okay, man, like, <laughs> you're willing to do it. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and is this, you know, to ex explain a little for those of you who, who don't really understand how comics work and basically, you've got to get the picture in and you've got to get the words in. Therefore, which comes first? You know, if you're not, because uh, Eric is working on the pencils and the the inks and the lettering, he can work everything at the same time. Whereas if you've got different people doing those things, you know, the artist will draw some sort of idea, then he needs to leave, leave space for the dialogue, for the word bubbles or the, you know, the narration. Incidentally, I have to say, I love his use of the lettering for the narration. Um, rather than just putting it into a little square box, which is very common, that's the way you show narr you know, a narrator voice as opposed to dialogue, which obviously has a, a tail on a balloon. He's just got this very subtle line at the top for his narration. Any idea why he did that? Or was that just something he decided to do? Not sure. Yeah, I think it's just a stylistic choice. I think I've seen it in some other books, and it's often used when. Uh, it, it's, so it's not just like a thought, it's like right. it is specifically like a narration or like somebody looking back on something. Ah. Uh, it's just like it's a stylistic choice that Eric made and he's a, he's a good letterer uh, in his own right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's very good. Okay, so we, you've got all this. So you've got you, the story. That, so you've written this great... What about the recent, I mean, one of the things that's really clear about this is that obviously this deals with homeless people. Uh, perhaps the question is for you, Zach, to begin with, 
what was your reason for choosing a homeless person as your hero or um, you know, dealing with homelessness to begin with? So I'm from the, the smallest province in Canada. Um, and I'm from a really small town. And like I had traveled a little bit through the UK and through Europe and everything, and I had saw homelessness. But where we went to school, or where we went to film school, was basically right on the edge of the downtown east side. And so every day when I went to school, I would walk through what was effectively the dregs. And that was really eye-opening to me, to be from a small town that we would maybe have maybe one or two homeless people, population of like 6,000 people total. Mm -hmm. And so to see three or 400 homeless people displaced on the street on my way to school every morning was just like, you know, that's uh, pretty harrowing to go through. So I started to think about how do these people like take care of one another? How do they look after one another? There's gotta be some sort of community. And in raising those questions, there was a serial killer a couple years ago in Vancouver called Robert Picton. And he used to pick uh, homeless women up off the street, inject windshield wiper fluid into their necks, uh, take them out to his farm and feed them to his pigs. And so, people started looking for these women when they were going missing and they never really found them until 12 years after it all happened. So naturally I was like, all right, let's, let's figure out a way to tell this story. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that, that's amazing. How do you, do we, do they know how many victims? He no, maybe, it, it, was, it was an excessive amount. It, it, it was sort of, you know, the, for him, uh, it was it's a terrible term, but like the perfect victim because people who are displaced uh, and on the streets here uh, often don't have very much family. And so when they go disappearing, people assume that they've either died and gone away or that they got clean and escaped. Um, and so that's, you know, there weren't people looking for them as hard as they would if, uh, you know, if someone who was more fortunate went missing. Uh, so it was able to go on for an unfortunate amount of time. Uh, and it was just a, a really sad case, but that was quite eye-opening in terms of uh, just how little the city uh, and the people who inhabit it care about uh, those who are on the streets. Wow, wow. Um, so the is, is that still the same case? Do you still have the dregs in Vancouver, or has that been resolved? Oh, yeah. It's uh, it was actually really weird, like because of the journalism work that Zach and I do, we keep up, we read it every single day. Mm. Uh, and as we were writing the dregs, certain fictionalized elements that were put into the story were becoming more real. Like we would read headlines talking about uh, there's an opioid crisis in Vancouver right now, and one headline said that the morgues in Vancouver were full and there was at capacity because there were so many drug overdoses happening uh, with people who were addicted to fentanyl. And it was just, that kind of stuff has become almost commonplace in our city. And it's a massive problem. And there's some, there's outreach and there's great initiatives going on, but it's, it's not enough uh, on a provincial or a nationwide level. You know, we, we had no idea how topical the book was going to become when we started writing it. But. And you've got photographs in the book. Um, tell me a little about those, please. So the photographs, uh, this is, for those who don't read comics, uh, sometimes there's something called like a back matter or back material, and it's basically supplemental material that uh, the creative team puts in there to, uh, you know, heighten the story or the experience. And the one that we have is a photo series called Off Hours by Dan Nguyen. Uh, she's actually my girlfriend, but she was working on this project before we even started writing the drags and it sort of just uh, beautifully coincided with what we were doing and the idea of the photo series is to just highlight people who are living on the streets, but not in a depressing way. It's done to highlight them engaging in uh, like leisure activities or passing the time with hobbies. So you see things like people drawing or people carving wood or whatever it is that they do to pass the time. Uh, while they're on the streets. So it was just sort of like, for us, I think it worked because it was not just uplifting, but it put a real face and a real sense of placement to what was going on in our uh, you know, animated version, comic book version of this. 
So it brought everything back to reality at the end of every issue. Mm. Mm. It, it, uh, they're incredibly effective. I love the guy um, playing with the bubbles. Yeah, that yeah. was one of my favorites too. Yeah, yeah. What, was you, what do you think was your greatest challenge with the book? I think the greatest challenge for, I mean, when I was thinking of it, it was just, there's so many things that you can do wrong with a book dealing with drug addiction, homelessness, and mental health. And we were just really scared of coming across as exploitative. You know, so we did a meticulous amount of research and went out of our way to interview and talk to homeless people uh, to try to understand what their life is actually like. Yeah, I, I think it was like that authenticity, right? It was making sure that if this, if, if someone who did spend some time on the streets read this book, that they would kind of see that we put in the time and that we talked to people. And like, you know, it was really fascinating because we started, started putting ourselves in the position to, you're surrounded by homelessness all the time when you live in the city, right? Mm. We started to go out of our way to talk to people and, and sit down with people and just find out who they are, what they're going through. And I can remember, uh, I think it was like when we were writing issue three, we were really stuck. We were at my place last summer and we were sitting down and we were stuck on a beat that I, I can't remember what we couldn't figure out, but we couldn't figure something out. And so we went down to a park by my place and we just started like swinging on a swing set and a homeless woman was, came up to us out of the blue and we talked to her for maybe like two hours. Yes. Her name was Barb, but she got us to call her barbecue, which was just amazing. And like, there's, there's stuff like that. And from talking to her about what she was going through and everything about her struggle, we came back and we knew how to fix that part of the script, you know? And it's just like a lot of that. We, there's people that we met on the streets that are in the book. Right. When you say they're in the book, you, you've written them as characters, or you you're using their likenesses. They're a bit of both. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's there's that moment in issue two with the the highlighter drawing that is something that legitimately happened in real life with the the stick figure. Uh huh. Um, Another one, yeah. It, it's a kind of like it's a mix of something that happened in real life with the fiction of what we needed to happen in the narrative of the moment. But we had run into a homeless woman in Seattle when we were at Comic Con. Yeah, and she said that she wanted to be a comic book artist, and she got to flip through her comic, and inside the book there was only one stick figure drawing of the Space Needle in highlighter. And so we, we talked to her for a little while, and uh, you know she was having a rough night, and and we got to kind of connect with her on that level, and we're just like we're gonna do this as a little tribute to her and. So that was like our way to get her, her name's Crystal in the book. Yeah, I don't remember her name in real life, unfortunately. But that was our way to kind of tip of the hat to that moment that we had with her. It's, a, it's an incredible. I, I, I've got the pictures. I, I, I know the page. I've got the page in front of my eyes now, and it's like it's incredibly moving yeah. um, because you you know you've you've handled it so well. We're talking about this, and obviously it's based on a terrible situation, you know, inspired by, you know, the killings, etc., and the, um, uh, this is not a good position for anybody to be in for homelessness. It doesn't feel like a, a worthy book. It is incredibly entertaining because, uh, you know, you follow your hero's um, progress because he decides to take himself on a detective mission to find out what's happened to his friend. We talked about this. The, who supplied, who, whose idea, or, or was this a part, Zach, was this part of your original script? You said it was a detective. Had you got this idea of kind of film noir detectives and all the famous no. detectives originally I, in the script? No, I think that was uh, a lot of Lonnie to be honest, like he's got a lot of affinity for detective fiction and that kind of thing. And like, I had read, I've read some Dashiell Hammett and I've read some Raymond Chandler, but like, uh, it was, you know, we came together and we decided this is a character that should be inspired by these things. And it was like, it really made a lot of sense to make it like meta textual in that way, you know, where he, he really does, he, he's like an everyman, you know, he mm. represents, uh, as much as, uh, his own love for fiction as our love for fiction, right? And so uh, we tried really hard to push that through, and that was like Bonnie's major mission, I think. 
<laughs> Who's your favorite detective writer, Lonnie? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Top, you know, two or three. Uh, I mean, Raymond Chandler was was one of the first that set me off, but I also really love uh, Hester Hines and Patricia Highsmith Hughes. Um, they're all they're great writers. Um, my favorite. I also love Paul Auster's detective stuff. He's a lot more contemporary and postmodern, and comes at it from this approach of unreliable narrators and meta text and self-referencing. And that's something that we wanted to bring a lot into the book. Um, There's a lot of his City of Glass in, yeah. in the Dregs, right? Um, and yeah, I don't know. There's just there's such a rich history, and it's it's so North American to have these detective stories, and it's such a there's a mythology around it that's very much ingrained in American culture. And we wanted in creating this detective character who was homeless, his homelessness sort of in, in you know being hardened by life on the streets allowed him to be both the antithesis and the epitome of the hard-boiled archetype. Uh, so we just sort of embraced that and it just fit. Yeah, it just it turned weird. going together just really perfectly. Well. Yeah. Um, and so we just fully embraced it, but we didn't want it to just be sort of like, here's this homeless savant detective who's really good at his job. Like, no, he has severe mental health issues and drug addiction and he'd probably be a really horrible detective. So how can we watch him stumble through this case this is like failing upward I know. <laughs> yeah. well there's also the interesting thing is that you know it's not a who done it because you know who done it to begin with yeah mm -hmm. it, it's, it's like an episode of Columbo and that you see you know it's the journey to find you know is 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 our detective really going to solve the case and it's Therefore, you're not concentrating on the who done it. You're concentrating on his journey as a person, um, which I, I think is one of the strengths of the book. Um, it always used to annoy the hell out of me on Columbo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it, it works incredibly, incredibly well. Um, the, the other person we haven't spoken about, um, the other member of the team, is Dee Cunliffe, who did the coloring. Uh, for the comic, how did D get involved? Um, D got involved. I mean, we had, we had been big fans of D's work for a little while, and we originally had another colorist on the book, and weren't exactly happy with the way things were turning out. So uh, we amicably parted ways once the book was picked up, and we started looking for a replacement. And D was available, and was his colors are just fantastic and, and one of the things I can't say enough good things about D but like he was really open to uh, our pedantic <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was really helpful because like we you know we put a lot of tone in the script and a lot of like color references and, and lighting references and I wanted to make sure that that was communicated and I think I'm not sure because we never talked to him about this but we were incredibly hands-on um, with a lot of that stuff. And I remember in the first issue, like some of the pages, we went through maybe 12 or 14 different versions of, of the colors, and he was game. Like he was 100% down. So, and especially coming from two writers who like haven't really done that much before. <laughs> yeah. like, man, if I was him, I would have been like, who are these guys? <laughs> who <are> they? <laughs> well, I, it's, I, just, I was just thinking, God, you're so lucky these days, because is he presumably this must be digital coloring in that case yeah yeah and, and he's it was really cool though because I think like that we had there was a lot of collaboration on the first issue and then we started to get better with the second issue I mean by the time we were at the third and fourth issue like Dean knew he knew exactly what scenes needed and when and there are so many things that he added to panels that just made them like there's that panel in the at, of Arnold in a cop car looking out the window with the lights reflecting on him. And that's all, I mean, Eric's art is incredible, but D added all of that like color wash on the window and oh man. We gave him like a crazy photo reference that was a still image from the movie Carol by Todd Haynes. And he just because nailed it. It was like, I love this shot. And we were like, there's no way he's gonna be able to do this with like the bouquet effects and like the rain coming down. But like, let's just see what he does. And he just sent it back, and we're like, "Oh my god!" It was just like a <laughs> first try, knocked it out of the park, no problem. Like it was just so—I don't know—he's a dream collaborator. 
we want him back on anything we do next because yeah, he's, he's just great. he's just so good. It's also yeah. worth mentioning that uh, we actually had approached a couple other colors beforehand. One of them who's agreed to do the book, and then once they saw the page, oh they, yes, forgot about this. They said that they they found the work too disturbing and wouldn't be able to work on it. Yeah, and we're like, they probably just mean they're a nice person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, fair enough. There is someone getting decapitated on page three. And castrated, <laughs> yeah, so... Because, <laughs> obviously, when Lonnie sent it through to me in February, because I'd seen one of your early... You'd sent me one of your earlier uh, short stories, comic yeah. short stories, Lonnie, um, and I had no idea what I was being sent, so I, you know, I was like, okay, great. I, you know, I really enjoyed the last one. I'll open this up, and I'm going, oh, yeah, this Victoria looks like... like uh, what am I reading? <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> Oh my god, what? No, this is just the first three pages. Uh, oh, and, and it's, it's, oh, it's this? Oh, yeah. for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just kind of like, oh, wow. And then it's like, okay, all right, I'll stick with it. Oh, this is, oh, this is really interesting. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is in, not only that it's important um, as well. And as I say, if anybody listening to this or watching this is thinking, oh God, this sounds like a real drag. It's not, it, it's not in the slightest. This is one of the things I, I, I think is part of the genius of the comic. It is entertainment. You know, this is a, a comic, it's dealing with, as we say, very difficult uh, and important topics, but it is, it, it is so beautifully done. I found it absolutely spellbinding. Um, what, what, what so talking about that? What do you think was the you, we t talked about the, the most difficult thing? What was the greatest joy in working on this? What was your what's your fondest memory of working on this? I mean, there I, I think a lot of it came for me anyway, like during scripting, where like we we spent a lot of time on on our scripts, and we spent a lot of time scripting issue one in particular, and there was a lot of moments where. We didn't, well, I didn't really know what the hell we were doing. We were just kind of like, all right, like we're putting this together and like we made sure that it was all meticulously constructed. But there's this idea that no one was going to like this, that we were only really doing this for us. And, and in doing that, I think we made a really, a story that we're both extremely proud of. But I can remember the day that came out and it was like trending on Twitter. And that was just like a, that, Go, like I, I, I had like tears in my eyes the whole day because I was just like, what is going on? Why do people like this? This is not something people should like. You know, just can't reconcile that ever. And it's still really strange to this day. Yeah, I, I think for me, the, the greatest joy, the best part about working on a book is just getting, being able to collaborate with Zach and Eric and Dee and, and learning that there's people out there who are as strange as I am and who want to tell stories like this. It is seriously, it's a very heartwarming thing to know that there's people who are interested in the same kind of thing, and it's the sort of family that you're able to build. And all, all of the press we're getting and all of the kind words and stuff is amazing, but it, it doesn't compare to me to the closeness that we've come together as a, as a team mm -hmm. to create something together that we're we are proud of is what, what I'm. Uh, most happy about it. yeah, and I don't wanna, like Eric and D. I don't want to lose them ever. Like I'm, I'm, we're both just like don't work on anything else. Just come work with us. Keep working with us. Let's just keep this ball rolling. They are working on a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, they have some amazing books coming out next. Uh, I can't talk about Eric's, but it's very exciting for him. Eric's been working in comics for like a decade, like way longer than we have been. Yeah. And, He's been grinding and working so hard, and he's. I think the drags uh, finally opened some bigger doors for him, and we're. I mean, he's, we, we couldn't be happier for him. He's busy for the next year, so. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we talked about inviting him on, but basically, he's got. He's got. This is, and this is often the case with artists that when you find somebody, you know, because how long did the project take, by the way? How you know, obviously, the first issue was out in February, but it all told, how long did it take? I mean, we wrote the pitch December 2015, I think. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, and then, no. It was, before the, it was December 2014, yeah. I think. 
and then it got picked up in March 2015. Um, so at that point, a pitch for those of you who are, don't know, it's uh, basically a five-page document that outlines the story very briefly, talks about the twists in the book, outlines each issue, and then has some sample art pages to go along with it. And I mean, the sample art pages, four of them are still in the book. So the, the whole castration scene and, and getting turned into sausage, that's how we pitched this book, <laughs> which is, uh, is looking back is a little insane. But aligning with Black Mask, like we, the book got picked up in March of 2016. And I mean, we started scripting or started researching in April and we didn't finish until late January, so. early February. For the for Wait, no. When did we finish issue four? Scripting it? Yeah. Well, that was not that long ago. <laughs> yeah, it's it, like a few months ago, maybe. Yeah, so it, probably uh, a year, all told, to write all four issues. And and the, for how long did um, uh, Eric have to illustrate all this then? Eric had a couple months of runway before the book was going to be released. Yeah, I think he started illustrating in August or September of last year, um, and he, I mean, he was down. In, we were down to the wire for the last issue. The last day we handed it in before it to go to printers. Yeah, like it, we, we proofed the last pages and it went to the printer that day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this reminds me of how I used to work when I was, write, when I was writing comics. It's just yeah. like, I had FedEx guys standing on the doorstep <laughs> and it was coming out of the printer it's a terrible way to work it's just a, an appalling way to work um it just i don't recommend it in the slightest um, and obviously you work together you say you work to, you, you write each how do you as the two of you is this is a question i'm always fascinated um when I'm, I'm talking to writers who work together how do you physically work when you're writing I mean, yeah. much like you see us right now, actually, <laughs> we, we, both, we sit beside each other with the same Google Doc open, uh -huh. and uh, we both have our own laptops, and we, we talk about, we generally talk about scenes before we write them, and what we kind of want to do, and then we basically both type in the same document and like edit one another as we go, have many arguments along the way as to what will be good. And uh, it, it's like having an editor in the room, right? It's just someone to bounce ideas off of and make them stronger all the time. Yeah, and so people ask us, like, as co-writers, how do we split the work? We don't. Yeah. We don't write anything unless we're both together, which is probably why it takes so long yeah. for us to get stuff done. But there's no splitting. It's just like yeah. it's a cohesive unit. That I think we wrote up literally page. one page of the drags via you know, Google Hangout, and that was it. And the rest of the time, we were in the same room together. Every wow. Time. Yeah. Wow. And that is it's interesting. Okay, so you use Google Hangout as well. So when you physically can't be together, you do more or less what we're doing now, but have the same document open. Yeah, I was on like a, a vacation, and we just like had to get one page done or something. And so it was just like we. We did it, but like otherwise, we make a point. I think there's some, there's a lot of like vibrant energy when when you're sitting in a room and collaborating with people, and I don't think you get that necessarily via a Google Hangout. Or there can be a delay or or whatever. And like you know, what we like to do is like pull books off the shelf and go like, okay, let's let's take this line of dialogue, uh, or like let's think about this panel layout and stuff like that. So we're we, we look like people embroiled in a murder mystery at some point, just surrounded by comics and yeah, notes. And we're method writers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what else? Okay, so the, the, the dregs, it's coming out in trade paperback, as we, we mentioned, the top of the, and basically you can go to Amazon uh, to, to pick up all your local comic book store to, be, to pick up the actual trade paperback. What else have you got, are you working on, have you got coming up? Um, so, Originally, before the dregs came out, uh, Lonnie and I got together and, and basically uh, put together a pitch for like a Cronenbergian throwback to like 70s, 80s body horror movies, but taking more contemporary themes about like social media and, and sharing and uh, that. So I don't know how much we should say, but probably not too <laughs> much. But yeah, it's basically a, a weird body horror book about sharing culture and social media and how. 
that could possibly lead to degeneration of the human form. <laughs> that sounds fun. Okay. It's, it's, it's like if David Cronenberg directed Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, <laughs> which is insane. <laughs> <laughs> but I quite like to see that movie. And, it, it, and is this is this is a. Co- is this is a comic book? This is a comic yeah, book. Yeah, this yeah. is this will be at Black Mask. Um, right. I don't know when, um, but yeah, I, I, they've been. We found a, a home there, and they've been phenomenal to us. Uh, Matt Pizzolo, the guy who runs Black Mask, has just been so crazy supportive in the face, like. There have been so many times where we've called him and we're like, we don't know what we're doing. And he's like, don't worry about it. You're, make your comic. Don't worry about what other people might think or anything like that. Just like push forward. He's, yeah, he's amazing. He's, he's the best. Yeah. Yeah. Very talented writer. In his own. Yeah. Yeah. He's everything we want to be. Um, so other than that, we have another comic book with a different publisher that I can't say too much about other than it's, uh, I hate this term, but it's a, spiritual sequel to the dregs. Yeah. Uh, just in that we're dealing with some similar uh, ideas and a similar character and similar allusions to literature throughout the book. Um, it's actually insane to me that they greenlit this book because it's just like, it's, when we, it, it's so hard to pitch to people. It's just gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to see where things go from here. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, when it comes out, they'd come back on the show and talk about it. Now, you you, <laughs> you talked about horror movies. Uh, sorry, body horror. Are you fans of body horror movies? That's our bread and butter. Yeah, I, I think I think that's where I think like Cronenberg was the the place where we really started to come together and talk about collaborating because it was like I think we both were like, where is body horror lately? Like, what? Why are? Why is that not existing in? in in film and in, in literature and in comics and that kind of stuff. And so we really, like that was the impetus for our collaboration. With yeah, the there's currently right now, there's about <laughs> half a dozen Clive Barker books in front of me on this desk. And there is a skeleton anatomy drawing behind us. Yeah. And there's some more on the table. And it's just a, it's a very interesting genre that I think allows you to play with the human form and, and talk about humanity and what it means to have a body while exploring uh, existential themes. And I, I think it's a it's a very smart genre of horror that often gets cast aside because people think it's just blood and guts. But uh, anyone who really knows the work of Cronenberg or Charles Burns or Clive Barker understands that it's uh, it's one of the more intelligent subgenres. Uh, and we, yeah, we love it and we're trying to bring it back and in a way. Both want us to be called Cronenberg Jr. <laughs> <laughs> it's a worthy ambition. It's a, <laughs> a worthy ambition. And one of our viewers has asked a question, um, and I, it, this is always a difficult question to answer, the way he's phrased it at, um, which was the better for body horror movies, the 70s or the 80s? Oh, boy. 70s. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Early Cronenberg stuff is my favorite. Um, especially his early shorts, and uh, they're just, they're so, they were so ahead of their time. And I love a lot of Cronenberg's uh, 80s stuff, but his early stuff for me has always, always been where it's at. I'm a big fan of the 80s stuff, personally. But. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, and the, and the subsequent, uh, the follow-up question to that, this is from Derek. Hi, Derek. Thank you very much indeed for watching and joining us. What was your favorite body horror movie and... Was there a horror mo- a body horror movie that was too horrible for you to watch? So um, what was your favorite? And was there one that was too horrible to watch? The second one, no. There's no there's <laughs> like I grew up in a household with an older brother, and I can remember when I was, I think, seven years old, he made me watch the scene in Day of the Dead where Rhodes gets ripped apart until I threw up my dinner just on repeat. And so from that moment, I've kind of just been born into this world where it's like nothing bothers me anymore. <laughs> um, but favorite body horror movie is Videodrome. I think uh, I think that movie is incredibly ahead of its time and you can still watch it today and it has commentary on our current society. 
Mm -hmm. And it's so perversely weird and meticulously crafted. I like, and it's filled with just like such good imagery. I, I yeah, I can revisit it every day. It'll never get old. Yeah, I would say video drum is probably my favorite as well. Uh, in terms of that like tech, tech body horror, social commentary stuff. Um, but I'm also Hellraiser is uh, is honestly yeah. one of my favorite favorite horror movies and the way that it deals with body horror in the sense of the division between pleasure and pain, I think is something that uh, was lost in a lot of the later films and Clive's been, you know, he's been exploring that consistently in his work ever since. And I, I love oh, those yeah. ideas and not being afraid to explore things like fetish and sexuality in a way that's sort of deeply perverse, but also highly arousing and provocative. Um, so, the, you know, Cronenberg and Clive Barker are very different uh, in the way that they approach it, but the way that they do it, I think, uh, you know, they stand out to me and those are my two favorite. Mm-hmm. And something we totally forgot to plug, but we got to write Hellraiser this year. Uh, we got asked to do a, a story in the new Hellraiser anthology, and I think, like, for Lonnie and I both, like, to, to our second project in comics was writing in Clive Parker's world, and I think we both, like, yeah. I can remember writing Hellraiser down on a page of my journal to, like, start generating ideas, and I was just, like, shaking. It's just like, how is this, how is this reality? <laughs> <laughs> so the, is this, which, which volume are you speaking of? Volume two. Uh, we will have a six-page story in there called, oh, what is it called? Quietus. Quietus, yes, yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. very, very cool. Because I've, I've got my short story in there as well. So I, it's kind of like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. I thought it was... <laughs> and, and, and I know this is completely coincidental because we were talking, but Zach, could you please stand up and show us your T-shirt? Oh, yeah, for sure. So this is the new Cavity Colors, like, night breed thing from Francisco Francavilla which has also got Cronenberg on it, which I didn't realize. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, conversation we're having. <laughs> I just like to bring everything around full circle to Clive. <laughs> and, 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 and so, yeah, it, it, it is to me extraordinary. I think just link, thinking about Hellraiser and so on. For you, <laughs> I have to say, when I first saw Hellraiser, um, and I've read the script, and I don't think it's, and it's not in the script, it's not explicit, but I remember when I first saw Hell, I really didn't get what Frank was saying when he was saying, Jesus wept. At the end, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's he mean? I don't understand all this. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't know. I can't remember. I, I don't think I even had the courage to ask Clive at the time. I think it just, I, thought, <laughs> I don't understand what's he talking about. <laughs> line actually that a lot of people just think is this sort of like funny weird thing in the movie but when you consider the context of it it's actually like pretty deeply profound and sort of sums up the themes of the film yeah very much so and it's uh, ad lib too wasn't it yeah i believe it was yeah. as far yeah. as stories yeah. and I, I love such a such a weird and dark and perfect line. I <laughs> love showing that scene to people just to watch, like if they haven't seen Hellraiser, just to show it to them and just watch their face as they experience it. And then we are no longer friends, usually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Zach also has a giant Hellraiser tattoo on his thigh, yeah. which he won't show you because it's in a weird space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds painful. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was the only tattoo I got where I almost passed out, but I, I love it. I, I absolutely adore it. How many, how many hours did it take? It only took two, but um, I didn't eat beforehand, so that's why it was painful. I was like passing, I was getting tunnel vision, and the tattoo artist was like, did you not have anything to eat today? And I was like, sorry, no. And he's like, yeah, so I'm sitting in my underwear eating a cookie as he's tattooing Hellraiser on my thigh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, I, I as mentioned on the show before have no tattoos have no desire to have any tattoos it's a slippery slope it, it, <laughs> <laughs> i'm just too hairy for tattoos there's <laughs> no sense for me to have tattoos it would just ruin all the work it is it's just yeah it does it just never work you know if i thought they'd look really good 
Oh, they won't, honestly. They won't. <laughs> yeah. Unless I have it tattooed on my head where there's so little, um, yeah. <laughs> Richard's box just on the scalp. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that, you know, just a beautiful widow's peak. I could have a beautiful <laughs> widow's peak tattooed. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> um, and kind of gives me an image for a character. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Cool. Well, we're coming to the end of the show. So just to remind people that they could, as, as we said before, the, the comic we've been discussing is called The Dregs. And is that the name of the, is that the name of the area in Vancouver? Is that what people refer to it as? Or is that just your... That's just our fictionalized version of it. Uh, right. It's commonly referred to as the downtown east side. Right. Right. Okay. Well, the comic is called The Dregs. Uh, it's published by Black Mask, and it's going to be available on Amazon sites or your local uh, comic. As I say, absolutely entrancing uh, comic. I really urge you to read it um, for whatever, whatever reason. Just go out to yourself a favor and read that. Um, you've got other stuff coming up soon. And just wanted to remind people before I finally say goodbye that next week we're going to be doing the tribute to George A. Romero. Um, I, that's possibly been the most shared post I've had. I, I looked at, the, I put the post up yesterday. It was like, oh, it's been shared 17 times. Um, that's, I think it's going to be a very popular show. So I'm inviting you, if you've ever met George or been influenced by George, uh, to just share your stories. Um, I want to make this as open as possible in order to be able to handle everything. If you would like to come on the show live, as these two gentlemen just have, so I can have you, you know, we can, you can actually tell your story. Please, I'm just asking that you complete the survey that I've put on Facebook on the posts, and I'll be sharing again tomorrow. Um, there's a link there that you can just. Give me just give me a few notes of the stories just so I can kind of balance the um, program. But if you're not comfortable coming on and talking live, if you just want to make some notes, you can put them on there as well. And again, obviously, the sooner I get them, the easier it's going to be for me to make sure I can get as many on as possible. Uh, and then the other way is just to do what people have been doing is if you're watching live and you want to show your story, type in the comments. Craig will uh, have a look at them all and uh, pass them up to me so I can read them out for you. So that's going to be next week's show, which is the 100th edition of Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Um, actually, I still can't quite believe that. Um, and also, if you've subscribed uh, recently, thank you very much indeed. We're now up to 590 subscribers, sorry, 591. I checked, and then just when I double checked, it had gone up to 591. Um, so nine more, and we hit 600 subscribers, which I'll be really pleased of, about. So thank you very much indeed for subscribing. Uh, Lonnie, Zach, thank you so much indeed for joining me today. Oh, thank you thank for you having us. Having us. Yeah, this, was, this was a great interview. Yeah, it's fantastic. Good. Okay. I look forward to seeing more of your work and having you back on again to discuss it. Um, uh, weaponized just sounds sexily transmitted guns. <laughs> 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 That's the best three word tagline I think I've ever come across. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're like, once that's at the end of October, okay. Cool. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, please come back on. We'll we'll sort out a date. Um, so, right, um, ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching Chattering with Nicholas Vince. Uh, I've been chattering with Lonnie and Zach about their book, The Dregs. Please do yourself a favor, as I say, pick it up. I'll hopefully see a few of you next week when we're talking, uh, doing our tribute to George Romero. In the meantime, take care and goodbye. I'm going to hit.